uh, invite you to turn in your Bibles, uh, maybe to page one, uh, at least it's uh, book one, chapter one, Genesis, and we're going to be talking about God's creation. We've, uh, we're still in chapter one. It's probably been a month or so, and um, I hope at least I'm, I'm getting some excitement out of this. Um, I hope you are. Just the fact of God's creation and some of the stuff that's going on these days with uh, technology, just um, July 12th, um, the James Webb uh, Space Telescope thing, man, those images are just incredible. And I'm going to show you a couple more here um, in a moment. But uh, what we're going to be talking about is follow the science. You've probably heard that phrase a few times in the last couple years. Uh, trouble is, <clears throat> the scientists and the powers that be are not following science. And I'm convinced, and I hope you are, that wherever true science, and what I mean by true science, observable, testable, you know, science has to be open to falsification, right? You have to be able to observe and to test it. And nobody was there, nobody was there when the earth and the universe started, except God. And he's telling us how it went down. And uh, those scientists who are careful to look at the facts with open minds and research the factual evidence, there is no contradiction. I'm convinced there's no contradiction between God, what God says in the scriptures and what he has said in creation. Um, there's incredible progress in knowing little tiny little stuff microbiology. There's incredible advance in way out there, telescopic stuff, way out of the universe. They're finding more and more stuff all the time. And I'm convinced it's just more and more evidence that our creator is an awesome God. He is full of wisdom. He's full of power. And he has condescended to uh, let us in on a little bit of how he did that. And that's Genesis chapter 1 through 11. And um, God's enemies, which happen to be your enemies, by the way, let's not make any bones about it. You are in a spiritual war. The devil is seeking to devour you, to discourage you, to divide us. But uh, <clears throat> the, the enemies want us to believe that Genesis 1 through 11 is not literal truth. And unfortunately, many of those enemies are in the church. They're in our seminaries. They're in our Bible colleges. They're in our churches. They are influential Christians who are trying to cram somehow billions and billions of years of evolution into Scripture. And they come up with a lot of interesting things. Theistic evolution, progressive creationism, the gap theory, the day-age theory, um, and now the... Uh, the hypothesis that this is just, it's not really true, it's myth, but it's supposed to give us truth. Um, I prefer to just read the Bible like I would read anything else. Take it literally and look at the facts and see how it works. So um, what the Bible states as true should be supported by careful observation in the fields of geology, biology, paleontology, and astronomy. And I'm not an expert in any one of those. In fact, I don't, I'm not an expert in anything. But I can read God's Word. And I can compare what people are seeing out there in the fields and what they're writing about and discovering, and I can compare it to what God says. And so if the Bible states certain things to be factual, we should be able to look in these scientific fields, biology, astronomy, geology, all these things, paleontology, and we should be able to see corroborating evidence that what God says is true. And guess what we find in biology, astronomy, paleontology, and geology? Evidence that what God says is true. But the church doesn't have that confidence, folks. And my concern is, if we can't trust God's word on page one, we can't trust God's word the rest of the way. If some of this is a mistake, if some of it is mythology, if some of it is 
contradicted by sound scientific evidence, we've got trouble. But we should be confident, folks. Uh, there are incredible resources available, just as there are, are advances in, in uh, space exploration. There's advances in microbiology. There's advances in medicine. There's a, those things that are, um, those advances in technology actually work to support our worldview. So be confident, do your homework, and then speak the truth in love to anybody who will listen. In fact, if they won't listen, tie them down. <laughs> Shout the truth in their, in their ears, in love. Um, the truth is on our side. God has spoken through an inerrant, inspired word that on three different continents, on three, in three different languages, over the space of 1,500 years as the Bible was brought together, not a single Proven contradiction. Forty different human authors. That tells me there was some wise God behind all of this. And so I want you to be confident um, in what you believe. <clears throat> um, I'm, not, I'm not into recommending very many books, but I, I like this one, Objection Sustained. Philip Johnson, a uh, professor in a California university, <clears throat> has uh, written a number of books that he takes to task the evidence of evolution. Uh, he uses scripture, but he really homes in on the logic and the uh, tangible evidence for evolution being a fairy tale for grown-ups. And um, unfortunately, he says, um, evolutionists, and I'm not saying all of them, but the ones who write the curriculum, the ones who pass policy, the ones who are in charge of our educational systems, they have a sleight of hand going on here that they don't want you to catch, but he exposes it. He says, the theory is sustained largely by a propaganda campaign that relies on all the usual tricks of rhetorical persuasion. Hidden assumptions. By the way, all of evolutionary science, all of it, is based on assumptions. <laughs> the, very, the very idea that life can come from non-life is an assumption. They make it with such confidence and uh, big fancy words that they don't think we're going to catch it. There are scientific laws, I'll refer to one in a moment, that demonstrate incontrovertible evidence that life has never come from non-life. Say, well, you know, the scientists are getting really close in the laboratory of creating life. Well, actually, they're not. They never have been. But even if they were, what does that prove? That it took intelligent life to get things just right for life to come. So he says uh, they use assumptions, question-begging statements of what is at issue, terms that are vaguely defined and change their meaning in mid argument. Man, just, if you will just listen to what they're saying and ask the right questions, you can expose their, either it's an ignorance or it's a willful hiding of the facts that they don't think you're going to catch on to. They have straw men arguments, selective citation of evidence, and so on. The theory is also protected by its cultural importance. It is officially sanctioned by modern society and publicly funded educational authorities spare no effort to persuade the public to believe it. That's why for, I don't know, at least a decade, I've been telling people, anyone who will listen, get your kids out of public school. Get your grandkids out of public school. I know there are a lot of dedicated teachers, and uh, we've had some in here, and, and there are some that have retired. Thank God for them. But the system is anti-Christian. And not only that, the system is anti-science, no matter what they say. So get your kids out of there. Here's an anti-creation guy that's actually wants to be honest. 
He uh, was a reporter for the Washington Times and lots of other big, big shot uh, publications. He uh, retired and went into writing books, but he says at this point, it is necessary to reveal a little inside information about how scientists work. Uh, this is actually from his book, How the World Works. And you know, the fact is that scientists are not really as objective and dispassionate in their work as they would like you to think. Really? I, I kind of suspected that. But I'm glad he's fessing up. Most scientists first get their ideas about how the world works, not through rigorously logical processes, but through hunches and wild guesses. They often come to believe something is true long before they assemble the hard evidence that will convince somebody else that it's true. Motivated by faith in his own ideas and a desire for acceptance by his peers, a scientist will labor for years knowing in his heart that his theory is correct, but devising experiment after experiment whose results he hopes will support his position. That's not a creationist guy. That's an anti-creationist guy but he is admitting publicly and in writing of the bias of many so-called scientists. And when these people publish works based on their assumptions that they're hoping to prove, that's moving out of science into philosophical stuff. I showed you this last week, Stephen Hawking. He has gone on to... Uh, whatever eternal destiny he was headed for, he's there. And I, I take no satisfaction in that. I, um, I have said many times, and I think Christians, we need to be careful. We should take no delight in the deaths of uh, opponents. Um, whenever we preach on hell, we should do it with tears. This man is gone. And as far as I know, he rejected God, he rejected the Creator, he rejected his Savior all of his adult life. I don't know. But we're not able to notice the assumptions he makes here. This is, a, this is one of the smartest guys, according to the experts, that ever lived. I mean, he was influential. This guy could communicate, even though he was uh, disabled in so many ways. His mind was off the charts. Well, looks what, look what he admits to. We can't make cosmological models. That's like, how did the universe come into uh, being without some admixture of ideology? Man, do you realize how big of a confession that is? Here's one of the smartest dudes who was an evolutionist and a materialist. And he is saying... All of our positions are based, at least in part, about our ideology. Not the evidence, but it's what we want to believe. In the earliest cosmologies, man placed himself in a commanding position at the center of the universe. Since the time of Copernicus, we have steadily demoted to a medium-sized planet going around a medium-sized star on the outer edge of an average galaxy. That's speaking to some of this incredible technology and the uh, the Hubble telescope did a lot back in the 90s, but this James uh, Webb thing, wow, it's amazing. <clears throat> so, yeah, we're in a small planet compared to a bunch of other things, and our galaxy isn't the biggest one. So, we shall call this assumption the Copernican principle. Here's another guy who just died last July 4th, a little bit over a year ago. Um, a Cambridge professor, <clears throat> they named a, a whole wing of Cambridge after him just before he died. In fact, he's, in this picture, he's reading the letter notifying him, hey, we're naming a whole wing of our university after you. Thanks for your wonderful job. Look what he says. We take the side of science. Now, he's, he's already thinking science is over here. The Bible is over here. I want you to understand those two go together. If you, can, if you are accurately interpreting God's Word and you are accurately uh, interpreting the science, they will not contradict. But look what he says. We're taking this other side in spite of the patent absurdity of some of its constructs. Constructs. Well, like what? Well, that life comes from non-life. 
any scientist would say, that's a stupid idea. But some of them say, I believe it in any way. And he says that. There's a whole bunch of assumptions in evolution. But I can't bring myself to believe in creation. In spite of its failure to fulfill many of its extravagant promises, in spite of the tolerance of the scientific community for unsubstantiated just-so stories, you know, some of our Christian kids go off to college and they, they run smack dab into some scientific uh, class, some biology teacher or something who says, I say there is no creation and you better believe it. Or it's going to impact your grade. It's going to impact your future, impact your, or your uh, career. So what happens? They conform. And young people, probably we haven't done a very good job of insisting that this revelation does not contradict real science. We need some Christian students to stand up in class and take the heat and take these guys on. Of course, that's easy for me to say. I'm 70 years old, and I will never see another college classroom, I'm sure. But young people, have some courage. The truth is on your side. Be bold. Be convicting, be compassionate, and be uh, convinced. But what God says is true. Look what he says here. Because we have a commitment to materialism, we are forced by our a priori adherence to material cause. That materialism is an absolute, for we cannot allow a divine foot in the door. This is a Cambridge professor who uh, had a wing, a scientific wing, named after him for his uh, prowess. And what is he doing? He's admitting we are anti-creation because we're committed to materialism, not based on evidence, but based on I can't stomach the idea of a creator. Why? Because if there's a creator, I'm responsible to him, and I will have to live my life in the, in the, in the, with the idea I'm going to face him someday as my judge. I can't have it. So in spite of what my mind might be telling me, I'm going to be convinced in materialism instead of this idea that there was a supernatural, all-wise, all-powerful creator who made things. We've talked about this materialistic idea. We know the universe is not eternal. The material in our universe has not the properties of being eternal. It's winding down. It's wearing out. It's changing. So obviously, it could not be eternal. But these guys, and shame on them for teaching generations of young people that their ideas are the only ones that should be considered. This guy back in 1929 in Nature magazine Evolution is a theory universally accepted, which is, that's not true, but <clears throat> it's not universally accepted. Thousands and thousands of scientists uh, have exposed the weakness in the theory. But what happens? They get fired. They get silenced. They get intimidated. But I move on. <clears throat> it's not accepted because it can be proven by logically coherent evidence but because the only alternative, special creation, is clearly incredible. These are big shots. <clears throat> Anti-creationists. And they're admitting, <clears throat> we don't believe in this because of the evidence. In fact, we believe in it in many cases in spite of the evidence, to the contrary, but we are committed. We cannot allow the idea of a God this guy you'll recognize, Richard Dawkins, interviewer. Um, this was a, a creationist, invited him to come on his program down, <clears throat> down under in Australia. And during the course of the interview on TV, <clears throat> can you point to any, any example of a mutation or other evolutionary process that was information enhancing? In other words, the idea of biological uh, um, evolution is that mutations can sometimes be very helpful, and not only can they help that organism, but they can pass on that information to subsequent generations. So this interviewer says, Mr. Dawkins, you're, you're a big guy that's selling millions of books, and uh, you're an atheist, 
anti-creationist? Tell me one example of any mutation or process that actually added DNA information that was passed on to subsequent. He paused for 11 seconds. The camera's moving. Here, Dr. Dawkins, will you please give us one example? 11 seconds later. You know what he says? That is a question that nobody but a creationist would ask. Well, wait a minute. You've had 11 seconds to come up with a response, and that's it? A real biologist, notice how he's slamming anybody who accepts creation. You can't be a real biologist. You're, you're mental. A real biologist finds it an easy question to answer. It would only be phrased this way by somebody who doubts evolution happened. Okay, if it's so easy, give us one example of a mutation that passes on helpful information. Silence. Silence. This guy has sold millions of books, influenced millions of people, and he doesn't know how to defend the most basic assumption that he is making. Here's one more book I recommend, Refuting Evolution by Safardi. Uh, in the mid-90s, the National Academy of Sciences published an educator's handbook. Hey, teachers, we're going to help you instruct students <clears throat> in evolution. Why? Because we don't think they're getting enough of it. So we're going to, K through 12 and beyond, we're going to publish this curriculum so you will be better equipped to tell children, students, about evolution. Um, its purpose, many students receive little or no exposure to the most important concept in modern biology, a concept essential to understanding key aspects of living things. What's that concept? Biological evolution. What do we, what's the most important thing we can teach students in science? Biological evolution. What's the fruit of that? Does anybody ever stop and ask? Okay, we've had generations now of instruction on biological evolution. How has that helped? Most of the key aspects of living things in biology were discovered by creationists, by the way. Newtonian physics, we kind of touched on last week, and I got in way over my head, but that has never stopped me before, so I just, I just keep going. But many diseases are caused by germs, and life comes only from life. Louis Pasteur said that a hundred and six years ago. He demonstrated that life only comes from life. It's a scientific law, biogenesis. Evolutionists ignore it. I guess that's not a key concept. Modern classification system. Carolus uh, Linnaeus, Linnaeus, I think. Um, how to classify living things. They still follow his, uh, his system. Genetics. Uh, Gregor Mendel. Genetics. You know, Darwin could be forgiven for his ignorance in this whole area because DNA, he, he didn't have a clue. We didn't either until just a few years ago. But now that we study DNA, the incredible amount of information in this double helix that is passed on is so incredible. And it's a scientific law. If you start with this kind of an organism, you're going to end up with this kind of organism. They don't change to something else. Evolutionary genetic theory has a series of apparent fatal flaws that are well known to population geneticists. Not popular geneticists, but population. They study populations. But they have not been effectively communicated to other scientists or the public. These fatal flaws have been recognized by leaders in the field for many decades based upon logic and mathematical formulations. The population geneticists have generally been very reluctant to openly acknowledge these theoretical problems. But guess what? ICR and the Feed My Sheep Foundation <clears throat> uh, funded uh, now an app that uh, they call it Mendel's Accountant. And you can punch in some information and it will give back to you genetic information. And in fact, this is available free online. You guys can test it out for yourself. 
Mendel's accountant does this. The program is a state-of-the-art forward time population genetics model that tracks millions of individual mutations with their unique effects on fitness and unique location within the genome through large numbers of generations. It treats the process of natural selection in a precise way, mathematical. And uh, guess what? This incredible new technology shows us that the geneticists who believe in creation have been vindicated. And this is open to anybody. They invite, hey, if you don't believe me, check it out for yourself. And what people are finding is that these mutations, generations after generations, millions of them, they don't provide um, helpful information that is passed on to the next generation. That's a big deal for evolution, folks. What is the mechanism that can gradually, over millions and millions of years, change a fish into a T-Rex? Well, you just give it enough time, and there's some accidental random mutations. Voila! Well, show us one example. Dr. Dawkins scratched his head for 11 seconds and said, well, don't even ask me that question. It's so unscientific. That's because you're hiding something, Dr. Dawkins. You're hiding the truth. In fact, you're hiding from the truth. This uh, telescope, I'm just, you're probably going to see this slide for the next seven months. I'm just so blown away by this technology. Um, I showed this picture last week, different text. The initial publication of these images on July 12th of this year included excited astronomers looking for the center of the universe. Now, I'm just a truck driver saved by grace. I'm not the sharpest pencil in the pack, but I see something there that I know the creation astronomers, physicists, they're going to jump all over this. Because orthodox Big Bang theology, and I use that word advisedly, theology, Big Bang is there's no edge, right? There's no center to the universe, and it's expanding. These guys said, I heard them, this telescope is taking them back 13.6 billion light years, and they think the center of the earth, uh, universe is 13.8 billion. So they said, boy, with a few more dollars in our funding and a little bit more time, we're going to find the center of the universe. But that's contrary. It's contradictory of the Big Bang cosmology. For a long time, they've been saying there is no center. Now these guys with the big telescope are saying, yeah, we're really close to finding it. And this other idea about following the science, it's not just... Physics, it's not just astronomy, it's in sexuality. People who just berate us, follow the science, follow the science, follow the science. They're not following the science. Ketanji Brown Jackson, the first black woman to be nominated to the Supreme Court, when asked simply if she could provide a definition for the word woman. <laughs> she scratched her head for 11 seconds, you know, figuratively. Our beloved President Biden, um, and I say that tongue-in-cheek a little bit, <clears throat> pray for him, he's got COVID, but um, he said, I'm going to nominate a black woman. They asked his nominee, what is a woman? She said, I don't know. I can't answer that, uh, not in this context, I'm not a biologist. So I want to sit on the highest court in the land, deciding all kinds of issues, but I can't tell you what a woman is because I'm not a biologist. These folks, these elitists who want, you know, follow the science, they're not following the science. Why? Because she is beholden to the persons who nominated her to present a worldview that says there's no difference between males and females. Well, 
right here, chapter 1, we're going we're gonna to find out that's not true. But science tells us that. In fact, <clears throat> we're anticipating a, a grandson here in uh, any time. And when he comes out, the doctor is not going to scratch his head and say, what is this? He's going to say, congratulations, you have a baby boy. And this little baby boy had a, a sister, Reagan, when the doctor said, congratulations, you have a baby girl. There's no ambiguity. Now, I know one in one million babies born have some genetic defects that they may have uh, parts from both sexes. Those are the exceptions. This woman is smart enough to know what a woman is. She doesn't want to say it. Why? Because she'll get hammered. Here's another example. An article. Um, for America's progressive elites, science is violence. Now, where, where'd this guy, Benjamin Weingarten, where'd he get this idea? Uh, he watched this testimony before Congress. And... Um, Senator Hawley is asking, this is a lady, a professor, probably a brilliant woman, professor at Berkeley, and they're giving back and forth about pregnancies, right to life, abortion, all this stuff. And Senator Hawley asks, Professor Bridges, uh, in your testimony, you've referred to people with a capacity for pregnancy. Would that be women? Professor Bridges, many women have the capacity for pregnancy. Many non-women have the capacity for pregnancy. There are also trans men who are capable of pregnancy as well as non-binary people who are capable of pregnancy. <laughs> Senator Hawley, you can imagine, he was taken aback. Senator Hawley, so this abortion isn't really a woman's rights issue. And she interrupted. We could recognize that the impacts women while also the impact this impacts women while also recognizing that it impacts other groups. Those things are not mutually exclusive, Senator. Senator Hawley. So your view is that the core of this abortion right then is about what? Professor Bridges. Now notice he asked a specific question. What does she do? Dodges the question. I want to recognize that your line of questioning is transphobic and it opens up trans people to violence by not recognizing them. Uh, that's not what he asked about. He asked about could, could, uh, could men get pregnant. So Senator Hawley says, wow, you're saying that I'm opening up people to violence by asking whether or not women are the folks who can have pregnancies? Professor Bridges. I want to note that one out of five transgender persons have attempted suicide. Well, side note, that's tragic, and it's going to happen more and more. That's irrelevant to this line of questioning. She's trying to dodge it again. Senator Hawley, because of my line of questioning, transgender persons are going to be committing more suicide. Uh, we can't talk about this topic. Professor Bridges, because denying that trans people exist and pretending not to know that they exist. And then Senator Hawley <laughs> interrupts, I'm, I'm denying that trans people exist by asking you if you're talking about women getting pregnant. Senator Hawley, uh, no, Senator uh, Professor Bridges, do you believe that men can get pregnant? So she asks a direct question. Senator Hawley, to his credit, says, no, I don't think men can get pregnant. Professor Bridges, so you are denying that trans people exist. I don't know what to say to that. You know, it reminds me of uh, President Lincoln. He asked his opponents one time, uh, how many sh legs would a sheep have if you called the tail a leg? And people said, five. He said, no, the sheep would still have four legs because calling the tail a leg doesn't make it a leg. 
She is saying biological women who identify as male can get pregnant. Therefore, men can be pregnant. Listen, folks. <laughs> you can identify whatever you want to be. It does not change your biological sex. Children, children are being mutilated in the medical field because at six years old, they're identifying as the opposite sex. Now, why am I going through all this? Because a lot of people under the banner of science are liars. They're liars. And they're lying to our children. And they're giving other people under that banner of science a bad name. Because there are doctors and there are jurists and there are biologists and there are geologists who are actually trying to look at the evidence, but they're being shouted down. They're being denied a hearing. You know, people are leaving the medical field right now like gangbusters. Why? They're fed up. Some big shot who's not even elected telling them how to treat their patients? Are you kidding me? Well, it's happening. A lot of people, and, and see what we've done, our culture has told young people, science is good, scripture is mythology. And the fact is, a lot of people under that banner are lying you can hack off body parts. You can attach body parts. It does not change. And this is medical proven science. If you remove your breasts, it does not make you a man. You attach something to that now changed body, it does not make you a man. Your sex is in every cell in your body. How does that have to, what's that got to do with Genesis chapter 1? Well, check it out. Chapter 1, verse 11. Then God said, let the earth sprout vegetation, plants yielding seed, and fruit trees on the earth bearing fruit after their kind. Verse 12, after their kind, twice. Verse 21, after its kind. Verse 24, let the earth bring forth living creatures after their kind. An orangutan does not risk having offspring that are giraffes. An apple tree will not by itself produce oranges. Now, I know you can graft on some stuff. It's pretty cool. But the fruit of a plant is what that plant is. And we're going to see here in a minute, just like he did with all the animals, God made man, male, and female. No third option. Male or female. And that's how they reproduce after their kind. We're constantly berated by elites to follow the science, except when it comes to mandatory vaccinations. Uh, again, this seems like a little bit far afield. No, it's not. Some scientists are saying, you better get vaccinated. It's the only way to save the world. Well, uh, President Biden, again, he's been fully vaccinated. He's got COVID. Uh, we've had these vaccinations in the not-too-distant past. SARS-1, they developed vaccinations. Why don't you hear about it? They stopped it <clears throat> because in the tests, 10 people died. <coughs> 10 people died, SARS-1. Now, along comes the COVID vaccinations, and you're not told this, but there's a heck of a lot more people dying than 10. There are people being disabled. There are people who are being killed, young people. And now, oh, well, let's, it's not enough to have you old guys like Bill get vaccinated. We want to vaccinate three-year-olds and six-year-olds. Why? Against a disease that is no risk at all to them, or very, very small. 
Now, some of you are thinking, yeah, Bill, you're not a doctor. You're going way far afield here. Check it out yourself. Trouble is, we can't make informed decisions about this. Why? Because the science shuts us up. Anybody with an alternative viewpoint shouted down, called names. Just like this poor senator, he's just trying to say, do you think men can have babies? Should, it should be a slam dunk answer. You're transphobic. People are going to kill themselves over because of your line of questioning. Are you serious? We can't ask anything anymore? It's going to be hard to establish science. Follow the science, except when it comes to the subject of origins. You know, um, way back in the day, I, I served a term at the McLeod Elementary School Board. And uh, by God's grace, I was able to get them to pass a policy of equal time. That means if you address the subject of origins from an evolutionary standpoint, our official policy was to weed uh, to McLeod Elementary, you have to give equal time to addressing the subject of origins from a creationist standpoint. It passed. <clears throat> I was able to give the parents a tool to compel teachers to give equal time to both viewpoints. As far as I know, not a single person used it. Not one. They couldn't get involved. You know, they, they trust the teachers. They'll do the right thing. And so our generations are being lied to. <clears throat> Why? Because there's only one viewpoint being shared. It's a commitment to materialism, as these guys already admitted. And there ain't no way we're going to let in any creation idea. Well, it's not that my policy was to teach Genesis chapter 1. My policy said give equal time to a special creation worldview compared to evolution. It passed. And then it died. Nobody used it. It's probably still on the books over there somewhere. Parents, you better wake up. You better participate. There's school board positions. There's city council positions. There's supervisor positions. There's legislation. Uh, there's uh, positions in the legislature. We need somebody to, with courage and conviction to represent us. Except when it comes to human sexuality. I already touched on that. Except when it comes to educating our children. I already touched on that. <clears throat> well, creationists have some assumptions too. All of evolutionary science is based on seven assumptions. Non-life gave rise to life. Uh, invertebrates gave life to vertebrates. Blah, blah, blah. All the way down. Everyone. At every juncture. You know, we're, we're looking for a missing link. Are you kidding? The whole chain is gone. There's assumptions at every level. Well, let's be honest. We have some assumptions too. <clears throat> we believe that by the word of God, the universe was created by the power of God, Jeremiah, by wisdom of God, Psalm uh, 8. I didn't even look at I didn't put that on there, but Psalm 8 talks about that. By the will of God, by the Son of God, Jesus is the creator. Let's worship him as such. Let's tell people about his handiwork. Let's give him glory. <clears throat> Dr. Bernard Northrup. He has preached in our church in the old place a couple times. That which comes from the hand of God, creation, Romans chapter 1, and that which comes from the mouth of God, Genesis chapter 1 and elsewhere, will never contradict each other when both are correctly understood. Folks, uh, science is one of our best allies when it's accurate science. <clears throat> Genesis 1 through 5, just to review last week, um, God started time. He's in eternity, always existed, but there came a, a, a point in history, and I'm arguing not very long ago, certainly not billions, time started. Uh, the heavens were created, the earth was created, the light was created. Remember, we argued. Uh, you know, people say, well, God didn't make the sun till day four. How did he have light on day one? Hey, here's, a, here's some news. The sun is not the only source of light. 
The north and south was created when the day-night cycle started. That means there's an axis. It's spinning. There's poles. And with those poles, we get the magnetic field. And oh, by the way, it's measurable. The magnetic field is getting weaker. The poles have actually changed positions on a number of occasions. The earth kind of wobbled a little bit. That's measurable science. So if the magnetic field is depleting and we can measure it, we know that it wasn't eternal, right? Eternal is unchanging. It's not, it will never wear out, but the earth will, like an old garment. It's going to be rolled up, and we'll get a new one. God's going to do that. <clears throat> so matter in motion on the first day. Uh, this bias about materialism is just a bias. Material is not eternal. <clears throat> um, in the midst, verses 6 through 8, then God said, let there be an expanse in the midst of the waters. At first, the, water, the earth was just a big ball of water. He separated it <clears throat> in the midst of that. Um, we showed this last week. That blue thing represents uh, day one. The others are the heavens in, uh, you know, uh, space, second heavens, third heavens. And then here in verse 9, Then God said, Let the waters be below the heavens, let the waters below the heavens be gathered into one place, and let the dry land appear, and it was so. Do you understand that in Genesis chapter 1, there's only one continent? And there's not Mount Everest yet. So when we get to Genesis chapter 6, and it says the whole world is covered with water, uh, that wasn't a stretch. There's one continent, and there's not very many mountains until after the flood. There is Mount Ararat, and then uh, subsequent tectonic pressures made uplifts, the Rocky Mountains and all that stuff. But right here... God just gathers the land that was in that watery ball. He gathers it into one place. There's one continent. In fact, it's that way all the way to Genesis chapter 10, verse 25. After the Tower of Babel, in the days of Peleg, God divided the earth. <clears throat> They're making this tower. They're going to make a name for themselves. They're going to worship themselves. They're going to work their way up to heaven. And God says, oh, no, you're not. You've gone far enough. He confuses their language and separates the continents. Chapter 10, verse 25. Can you advance that one click, please? I don't know what happened here. Yeah. <clears throat> so just to wrap this up, I tried to keep, keep with uh, M's. Matter, midst, mainland, and min is a Hebrew word for kinds. So uh, days three through six, God is going to allow this, uh, this one continent and this one ocean and the one expanse produce plants, trees, fish, birds, and eventually humans. And what does he say to all of them? Be fruitful and multiply. Now, I know there are people that say, oh, there's way too many people on the earth. <clears throat> Have you ever flown over Nevada and those places? And they got lots of room. Afghanistan, Saudi Arabia, the world is not as packed as we think it is. And all these people who say, oh, we need to reduce the population, I don't see them volunteering to leave. All these billionaires, they want to reduce the population. They want to control the world. And by the way, Revelation chapter 13, they will. A one world government, one world economy, one world religion is on its way. That should be sobering for us. That should give us a sense of urgency to not only resist globalism and tyranny, but more important, preach the gospel of the creator slash savior slash 
future judge. He's coming back. You might have heard. Uh, we were just talking, uh, I think, Friday morning men's prayer about the, the T-shirt guy. He said, uh, normal is not coming back, but Jesus is, right? So uh, we're in a different uh, world than I grew up in. I always kid around, and Martin's here. Uh, he could testify, and Julian and Jenny, but uh, I was fortunate growing up in McLeod. The 60s didn't really hit until the 80s. So we, were, we got uh, spared some of that nonsense. Uh, but it's not now. It's worldwide. It's entrenched. Let's be intentional about telling people the truth in love. Not only Genesis 1 through 11 is true, Revelation 22 is true. Jesus Christ is coming back to establish his kingdom and to destroy, with his wrath, destroy all unrepentant sinners. But it doesn't have to be that way. You can respond in faith and avoid that coming wrath. Well, this is also a New Testament concept. Each tree is known by its own fruit, for men do not gather figs from thorns, nor do they pick grapes from a briar bush. Um, the, fix, the fixity of, uh, and, and we're not really sure. I, I've looked at all the stuff that I could find on this idea of kind. Um, it's not really species. It's not really uh, genus. It's not really family. We're not really sure what it is. But whatever it is, like produces like. And there are no transitional forms that gradually showed uh, changes from fish to amphibian or whatever. So what do they do instead? They theorize that evolution happened in giant leaps. So now get this argument. Their evidence for evolution happening is the lack of evidence that it happens slowly. So it's called the hopeful monsters, or it's called uh, Dr. Gould. He's passed away now, but he was a Harvard guy, very famous evolutionist. Uh, he called it punctuated equilibrium, which is just a, a, a scientific term for hopeful monsters, that things were kind of gradually changing a little bit, and all of a sudden a fish sprouted legs, and now it's on land. Whoa. And then uh, another hopeful monster, some mutation. Wow, now that thing has wings, and it's flying around. I'm sorry, and I don't mean any disrespect, but that is stupid. And there's no evidence. A fish is always a fish. An amphibian or a reptile or a snake, they're always what their parents were. Now, I'm not saying there's no such thing as change within that organism. They can adapt to their environment. In fact, that's one of the differences between rocks, material stuff, and plants and animals. They can adapt with certain limitations. Their DNA allows them to change to adapt to a different environment. But they never, a rose will never become a petunia. And you can, you can breed in all kinds of changes in roses, but as far as I know, there's no such thing as a, a black rose. You can dye it. You can't grow it. And, there, you know, people are gradually getting taller. I'm the exception. But, that, but they're still people. And birds are birds. Fish are fish. Uh, quickly, I'm going to go through this. <clears throat> this supposedly is a law. Uh, Professor Gould of Harvard published this guy's papers in, as recently as 1980. And what did he say? Basically, is evolution never goes backwards. It's always forward. The law of irreversibility. An organism cannot return even partially to a previous state already realized in its ancestral series. Organisms cannot go backwards. Well, <coughs> that's science, right? Except now, science says, of course, stuff goes backwards. <clears throat> Many creatures are found with features that their ancestors, quote, this is from uh, Randy Galuza, Dr. Galuza. He's spoken here at our church, too. 
Um, one example is mandibular teeth that reappeared in frogs after supposedly being absent in their lineage for 220 million years. There's no support for the model of irreversible evolution, this so-called Dallow's Law. It's not in science. It was in this guy's mind. And Professor Gould, who said uh, punctuated equilibrium has to happen, published his papers, this uh, French guy, or Belgium, uh, from in, in 1980. Well, now we've got all kinds of examples to contradict that so-called law. It's not a law at all. Single evolutionary reversals occur when a character changes from an ancestral state to a derived state and then back to, you know, this is <clears throat> science speak. University of Hawaii researchers in her study on a native bird species, studying their beaks, change. Multiple reversals extend the process by returning to the derived or ancestral state several times within a single lineage. There are three single and two multiple reversals of bill length on six main islands from oldest to youngest in Hawaii. They're observing forward changes and then reverting backwards. So the so-called science of the law of irreversibility, it's contradicted by observed science. And I mentioned vaccinations a little while ago. Here's another reverse evolution. The two other evolutionists hope to treat drug-resistant malaria through reverse evolution back to susceptible state. Now, again, there is adaptation. You, you get a shot, and uh, the virus uh, adapts to that. So now you have to have a, a more powerful shot or a different vaccination. Um, there is adaptation and reaction. But the lack of a coherent understanding of reverse evolution is partly due to conceptual ambiguity. The term reverse evolution is misleading as it implies directionality in a process that is nearsighted and agnostic. In other words, Darwin, his theory was through chance, random, accidental changes, things progressed. Random chance is not directionality. It's just as much a chance that evolution will go backwards if it ever went forwards, right? And these guys are actually counting on this. We need to be able to revert to a previous uh, effective vaccination to help people because the viruses, bacteria, and all these other diseases have adapted uh, resistance to the medicine. So, man, we got to somehow back this train up. That's in 2016. That's... That's recent stuff. So scripture says organisms reproduce only after their kinds. It was true in the pre-flood. It's true in the, uh, the arrangements where Noah's gathering the animals together after their kinds, the male and female after their kind, so they could reproduce when they get off the boat. It's even that way uh, in Leviticus and Deuteronomy in the Law of Moses. Hey, you can eat uh, this kind of stuff after its kind, but you can't eat this kind of stuff after its kind. So it's a concept that goes way beyond just Genesis 1 to 11. Science says organisms reproduce only after their kinds. Wow, really? Science agrees with Scripture? Of course it does. God created the world, and the laws that are actually laws of nature, there's a lawgiver. That's God. And thank God he revealed, in some cases, how he did that and what he did and how long it took and what's going to happen next. So if we can trust Genesis 1 through 11, man, we can trust the Gospels. When it says Jesus died for my sins and he was buried and rose again on the third day, I can take that to the bank. Why? Because everything God says is true. So when Jesus rose from the grave and he ascended in front of his disciples and he said, I'm coming back, I can believe that, and I want to be on his side when he comes back, don't you? So notice the frogs and the birds, they still remained. Some got bigger beaks, smaller beaks. Some of the frogs lost their teeth. Some got them back, supposedly 220 million. They're still frogs. 
And you can change a, a biological woman by surgery on the outside. She is still a woman and a human being. And Christ died for her, by the way. Whether she bought into a worldview that is grotesque and denies the Creator, Jesus loves her and died for her and wants to save her. And that's the same with guys that are confused about their sexuality and they're, 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 they want to be a female. And you can hack off parts, you can add things, you can claim they have babies. The fact of the matter is that man is still a man. And Jesus died for his sins. Jesus loves him. We heard our speaker, if you were here this week for the conference, one of the things he really emphasized was this, we're all on an arc of uh, experience and walking with the Lord. And uh, we're in the middle somewhere. And we who think we're down that road quite a ways, we had better be gracious to those who are not where we are. Give them time to grow, time to learn, time to change. Give them grace as God works in their life. And oh, by the way, we need grace too, because we're not what we are going to be. Nobody in here. I'm looking out here. I'm looking all around. I don't see anybody that looks exactly like Jesus yet. A lot of you have come a long way, praise God. But some of you, <clears throat> I'm just kidding. <clears throat> um, so just to close, that which comes from the hand of God and that which comes from the mouth of God will never contradict each other when both are correctly understood. That is a, a truism. That is a, that is a truth that you can, you can just rely on. Nothing God did in creation, Romans chapter 1 and Genesis chapter 1, will ever contradict what he has said in the rest of the book. Well, um, we have time to sing one uh, really fast song. Thank you for your attention. God bless you.